Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Sumer in our continuing study of the history of civilization. Uh, Sumer is that area of southern Mesopotamia where you have the Tigris and Euphrates River. They, they come together uh, close to where the, uh, the location of Babylon, and then they separate and then finally come together again and actually join before flowing into the Persian Gulf to the south. Um, now, at, at this point in history, we're, we're dealing with uh, the beginning of kings. We have the Enses, and these would be uh, sort of priest kings. Uh, but eventually, we're going to have in each city a Lugal, that is a big man. In other words, he's going to be the king. He's going to be the, the, the big fellow. He's in charge of everything. And, and not only his city, but sometimes surrounding cities as well. Now, the government during this period, we have a series of independent city-states, um, and they're each sort of a vying for control of their area, trying to stay independent from each other. Um, these are led by kings who claimed to be chosen by the gods. That's going to change. We're going to actually see uh, some of the kings say, eventually say, well, no, I'm, the go I'm one of the gods. I'm going to you know, sort of claim, claim that title of deity. Um, they maintained the irrigation. That was one of the big things that is a king's responsibility. Of course, he wouldn't do this personally. He'd, he'd have those wor working under him who would, who would make sure that the water would get from those two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, out to the farmlands where the people can farm and, and continue to grow. And remember, your agriculture is at the center of civilization. No agriculture, no civilization. Um, he also provides military protection uh, to stop raiders from another neighboring city to come and taking your crops and your livestock and your people and, and, and your city. Um, he would enforce the laws such as they were and, and we're going to look eventually at some of the early law codes of this period. Now this is a, an era of, of growing artistry. Now, notice the, the headgear that's been developed uh, of precious jewels, and I'm um, not sure if this was gold or not, uh, but we have necklaces. And, um, and at, the, at the top of this hierarchy would be the priests. Uh, there'd be the king over him, uh, th so there'd be the king, and then there'd be the priests, and under him would be the, the owners of property, and then you'd have the merchants, and the craftsmen, and finally at the bottom you'd have the serfs and the slaves. Now there's a difference. A serf is tied to the land. A, a, a slave is even lower than that. Um, um, so a serf has, you know, like a little bit of freedom, but not really. Uh, he's connected to the land, but then slaves, uh, they can be bought and sold from that land. One of the pictures that we have is of the stan royal standard of Ur. Now we're going to be t looking at the third dynasty of Ur at a later date, but this standard uh, gives sort of a slice of life as we look at it. And so for example on one side, notice we have uh, on the top panel uh, there is one in charge, this is the king, uh, and then there are others who uh, come before him either to uh, write or to uh, eat in his presence. As we look down at the bottom two panels, we have the merchants and those who were bringing uh, food stuff and supplies into the presence of the king perhaps, or maybe they're going out to, to other cities as they are uh, uh, trading and engaging in trading commerce with, uh, you know, with the people of southern Mesopotamia. We flip over to the other side, and now this is a picture of warfare. So that, again, on the top panel, uh, there's a chariot. No one's in that one, so perhaps uh, that's being brought for the, for the king. Uh, the king was the leader in battle, and notice on that top panel, uh, we're going to see everyone sort of facing the king. In the middle panel, we have the soldiers. Uh, they're getting ready for warfare. And in the bottom panel, we have the chariots. Uh, notice the chariots, they're, they're running sort of roughshod over the enemy. And you can see the enemy, those are the ones that are face down and the horses are trampling over them. Uh, chariots have uh, 
they've got two sets of wheels one set of wheel in the back one set of wheel in the front and these are solid the uh, the uh, Sumerians of this period do not have the idea of using of using spokes in their wheel that hadn't been invented yet and so our chariots going to rush into combat well not really it's not going to go that fast probably not not much faster than a person could walk uh, certainly not more than uh, one could run uh, and yet and yet this is going to be a major part of their warfare so we have uh, the military uh, you have the infantry with their swords and spears and you know axes and just just a stick with a rock on it really at the end uh, we have archers who are shooting but then uh, I have the chariots and the chariots were the ancient tank now it's going to be more so once we invent the spoke but that's not for another thousand years um, but I have the chariots as the tank warfare of the ancient world now I want to talk a bit about pottery um, pottery is a great thing for the archaeologists because they tell us a lot about a culture. First of all, when you have pottery, that means that you are sedentary. That means you're going to be in that place. You're not going, going to carry those pots into to a lot of different locations. And you can store your food. Now, notice the pots that we're looking at. They're very simple in design, um, um, rather ornate, but, but not much in the way of artistic quality uh, that's added to them. I move now to a later era, still in that early Mesopotamian period, and now I begin to see designs on my pottery. Now, each one of these is handcrafted and also hand-designed. As I look at the various designs, pictures, maybe uh, a man with birds and things like that, um, where my pottery is now becoming more ornate. Uh, here's a the Queen's Lyre. I don't know if it really belonged to the Queen or not, although we do have records of uh, really kings, not so much queens, uh, describing their ability to play these musical instruments. And so here's a, a beautifully crafted musical instrument. Uh, it's today it's in the British Museum, uh, and it's dating to this period, this early period of Ur in, in Sumer, southern Sumer. Here's another picture. Uh, this is of a a uh, a man, and notice the eyes. They're the most striking. The Sumerians believed that the eyes were the windows to the soul; that you could look in there and and see those signs of life. And so the eyes are presented very large, and uh, and and, and uh, ex there's a there's a big expression where you're looking at that individual and to gain insight into what he might be thinking and or feeling. Sumerian mathematics uh, give us a legacy that is still with us today. There are really two types of decimal systems that were used uh, by the Sumerians. One was the base 10, just like we use. You know, I have 10 fingers, and so uh, I get to 11, and the way I think about that is, well, it's really 10 plus 1. Uh, and so that's sort of the base 10. Uh, but they also used a base 60 in their math that is seen in the way they count their numbers. So in their numbering system, for example, you have uh, to, to say 1, 2, 3, you say guess mean S. Uh, but when we get to 60, notice it's guess da. That is, 60 is the, that next, you know, just like I go 1, 2, 3, 4, and then I hit 10, and I write it with a 1 and a 0 next to it, and then a 1 and a 1 is 11. They would do that with the number 60, and they would get to 120, and that was guess mean, and then 180, that's guess s, in other words, three times uh, 60, and then 600 would be guess u, and there was, there was this great number, if you want to describe this, you know, how we say a million or a billion, and they would say, you know, <laughs> sargal, which was uh, 216,000, that is 60 times 60 times 60. And so their math had that base 60, and we still have a remnant of that today when we talk about the uh, measuring something by degrees. That is, there are 360 degrees 
in a circle. And so we talk about, well, let's see, how many seconds are there in a minute? And how many minutes are there in an hour? There are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. That's a throwback to Sumerian mathematics. And of course, we finally have to talk about the Sumerian religion. We're going to uh, maybe uh, see a number of things about religious systems, but Sumer is all flat. It's sort of like the southern, the, the state of Florida, uh, where I live. Uh, it's, it's all flat here. You know, you've got a couple artificial little mountains made of trash. Um, but Sumer was like that in that the land was flat, and yet they felt the necessity to to worship the gods in high places. Well, there aren't any high places in southern Mesopotamia. So they would build artificial mountains, these ziggurats, in which there would be uh, a place at the top of the tower that was dedicated to the heavens, that would, was dedicated to the gods. Maybe it's for that reason that Abraham, his name, his original name, Abram, means father of the high place.